where to begin? My grudge with the Neoplatonists. That is what this is about. It is something that bugs me to the very depths of my very being. And the problem is, it is so ingrained as part of my 30 plus years spiritual experience and education. That it is so difficult. And the main problem is, I'm talking here to, I don't know, two people, three or four people probably, because how many people A, know Neoplatonism, B, are at the same time interested in Neoplatonism or parts of Neoplatonism, and at the same time pagans or polytheists. But I want to say it nonetheless, and I I, I believe in part, I, I have written quite a lot of stuff about it, you may or may not know that I am the headmaster inventor of the Scola E.T., the philosophic theological school named, named after myself. And I have written extensively about the differences of monotheism and polytheism. And I think I even wrote a rejection, emancipation against the Platonic One. Where to begin? Where to begin? One thing I have to say is the following thing. I am not sure if Plato would be in agreement with the extensive duality or dualism of spirit, good, matter, bad, one, good, change, bad, duality that Neoplatonism emphasized so vehemently. This is something that I am on an entirely basic and, and ground level of thought, partially out of thought, partially out of feeling, fundamentally disagree. But it is a plethora of points coming together, which is not easy to, to bring together as one. First, I have the strong intuitive impression, I have to say it in this way, that in a way Plato is to Socrates, in a way like Saint Paul is to Jesus. And that is not a flattering thing to say about Plato. Now, mind you, I have all the greatest respect to Plato. For instance, his The Apology of Socrates and his Phaedrus or Phaedros is something I really cherish and, 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 and love. And But there are other things of Platonic idea and Platonic writing which are abhorrent. For instance, his book The State or The Republic where he writes or lets Socrates speak. That is the difficulty we never know for sure. But I have, let's say, an intuitive, instinctive perspective on it, which I cannot prove rationally. From reading Plato, he usually lets Socrates speak in his own stead, which is something I personally profoundly dislike. Speak yourself. Speak yourself. And Plato has this uncharming habit of letting Socrates talk when it is quite clear that sometimes it is more he who is talking. And that is not right. It is not right. It is not right. I'm sorry. I profoundly dislike this. If you have an idea, say your own ideas. Make them distinct and clear. It is why I am not fond of the entire Platonic dialogue system, because it dilutes away it deludes away from understanding. I'm sorry, that sounds very harsh, but it is how I think about these things. When I read Aristotle or Cicero or other classic antique sources, mostly staying away from the dialogue or using long dialogue, like Cicero versus arguing with his brother about religion, then it is more Aristotelian in the way that there is one person speaking his mind. 
but all this dialogue trickery is it may have literal as as, as a sort of literature a charming effect but where is your thought argue with me explain me your idea in a coherent flowing text i believe that it is more it, it has this entire especially strong appalled was my impression about Plato's book, The Republic, the state, where he explains his his ideal state. And I'm sorry to say it, so many things that Plato says here, or he lets Socrates say, I don't believe a day that Socrates has, has said something so detailed about the ideal government. It contradicts Socrates' entire idea of himself. Socrates famous sentence i know that i know nothing and therefore i know more than those who don't know that they know nothing that is the humility of socrates that likely made socrates popular and hated at the same time because of his humility of questioning things socrates seems to be have to be a person of humility of kindness and then there is plato the saint paul of the entire story and at the same time as you see a kindness radiating through many of the things that Jesus said, and then there is the harsh, stern, dark St. Paul who brings the dark side to this newfound religion. And in the same way I feel about Plato. It is in some part, I am a classic liberal in the modern sense speaking. I am a supporter of Karl Popper's idea of the open society in the sense that there should be no ideology ruling us. And this is why, rightfully, Karl Popper has said that Plato's Republic is the birthplace of fascism and totalitarianism. I reject this. This is the first argument against Platonic idea that the entire construct, if we take it to that point, leads to totalitarianism and Plato's Republic is the invention of the totalitarianistic ideologic state. Period. Paragraph. I'm sorry to have to say such evil things about Plato, but that is fundamentally how I think and feel about the entire matter. Reading the entire idea of the state in the Republic for Plato has disturbed and appalled me to the core. And that goes back to say why the spiritual concept of Platonism and Neoplatonism is something I reject. It is wrong, it is dangerous, it is evil. I'm sorry that I have to say that strong. Let me go deeper into the matter. The problem is if you follow that line of which is especially emphasized in Neoplatonism. I've just read this book. I bring it here so that you can tell the title. Here it is. It is the title is The Lust on the Gods and the World with Pythagoric Sentences of Demophilus and Five Hymns by Proclus. Now the hymns under Platonic pythagoric sentences are not so interesting to us, but the Salustus on the gods. Now, good riddance. By translated from Greek by Thomas Taylor, and from the foreword, it is apparent that Thomas Taylor is also at least a Neoplatonic, probably also a Roman pagan. I mean, he's writing at the end. He's writing five additional hymns to the Roman gods, so we have to assume that he has at least some Roman paganism within him. But he turns, turns I'm sorry that to say, he, like all Neoplatonists, turning polytheism upside down, and not in the good way, but in the bad way. And it is so, it, it so is wrong to anything that I connect to paganism, polytheism. I use these terms interchangeably, although many polytheists of the Greek and Roman don't like this. I don't care right now. Polytheist or is just such a mouthful of, of letters. So I usually call it paganism for simplicity's sake. Anyway, the great book that, in my perspective, gives a good idea about what paganism 
polytheism makes different from monotheism is written in the glorious, fascinating, must-have-read book by Alain de Benoist, Frenchman, on being a pagan, which just recently has been re-released, thankfully, in the English language. And it explains all of it. Not that I needed to know it from there, because I have philosophically, philosophically argued against the erroneous and dangerous and wrong thinking of monotheist theology for decades. But it was good to read it in Alain de Benoist's book on being a pagan more concentrated, more sharply and more organized. The problem is the same. If you have a one which is the source of all things, that is a matter of numerology, as a polytheist, a pagan, and also, I might say, as a Thelemite, a follower of the teachings of Aleister Crowley, who was very keen in numerology, Kabbalistic numerology, I reject the idea of the one, the number one, as a non-existent and absurd number. The number one does not exist, spiritual speaking. I'm not even saying that the oneness should be redefined or should be made milder or should be... No. The idea of the one is an absurdity which does not exist. The formula which I hold against the one is the Crowleyan formula of zero equals two. Zero equals two. That is how logically creation can be. That means there is a duality, zero, which is made of plus one and minus one. But if they come together, what you get is zero. So you have the zero, the nothingness, but creation is logically made out of the pulling them apart. Like you become yin and yang in the Chinese philosophy. And the important thing, if you know anything about yin-yang in the Chinese philosophy, yin is not evil. It is not. Yang is not good. Yin and yang are male and female, heaven and earth, spirit and matter. They are two phases of reality. Period. That is all. Yes, of course, in a sense, like the male in the classic view, I have to say it as it is, is the dominant and the more sacred, and the female is the subservient in the energies. So is the earth sacred, female, but subservient to the male heavenly forces. Such is the nature of things. I'm sorry if that deeply offends all the feminists and most of the modern people. I don't give a crap. I'm a philosopher. I speak as I see things. Because ascending to the heavens means to connect with the powers to shape instead of being shaped. The earth is the energy, the yin of the yin-yang, is the force that you devote yourself you are being shaped. That is not bad because if you take the entire eco-environmentalist movement, if you take the young principle of our industrialization age too far, then you destroy the environment and you have the problem that our society have. Whether you believe in climate change or not is totally irrelevant. It is clear that the over-industrialization has destroyed nature to a dangerous point. Now, I have to refer to another teaching that is the teaching of the Druids. I'm speaking, of course, to the modern Druids because we don't know what the ancient Druids did. No matter how far it is reasonable or not for them to call themselves Druids, that is not really the point. I believe they have all the points because the term Druid became sort of vacant. There is this Druidry and one of the great Druid authors, or probably the greatest Druid ever, because he's really a very scholarly person and there are not so many other Druids of, 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 
of name, maybe beside the, the, the founders of the modern Druidry movement, maybe, um, which is John Michael Greer. John Michael Greer is one who has written about the end of peak oil from a material level, something about politics, but he's, of course, as a Druid, um, he, it was very fascinating, while I'm not personally into Druidry, their view is that, on the contrary, nature is sacred. Nature is sacred. The earth is holy. This is a variant of pantheism, which I'm personally not fond of either as another extreme. Which is why I say, if we say that there is a yin, which is the earth, mother nature, and there is yang, the will, the spirit, the mind, which is father sky, very generally speaking, or young, then it is that both have their place and both are being equal in the way that they are both equal and sacred. If you violate nature by the hubris of being too youngish, too heavenly, too much trying to... This, is, this idea of hubris is in every single religion, in pagan and, and uh, monotheist religion alike. That is, this is one of the few things that all religions have in common. So it must be a really important matter. Do not follow hubris. There is a story of Phaeton, the son of Helios, I think, who, who thought he was strong enough to charioteer the, the, the sun chariot and, and miserably failed. There is a story of uh, Apollo and Marsyas, Marsyas, challenging the god, believing he could play music as good as a god, which ended terrible for Marsyas. And of course, the famous tale of Icarus, who believed he could fly to the heavens and there would be no limits for him, and he fell down. We are creatures of matter, of Mother Earth, and of Father Sky alike. I reject, I deeply, fundamentally reject denouncing Mother Earth as evil Hüle. I'm not sure how you in the English would pronounce this. Hüle. As matter as the evil prison. And this book, this, this, this the cosmology of this Salust, is full of that. And interesting also are these hymns of Proclus. I have no idea who Proclus is, but it is not really of a great relevancy. We see that these people are Neoplatonists, Platonists, and it is derogatory to the earth. It is derogatory to the earth. As a pagan who is not into Druidry, but who thinks that Mother Nature is sacred in her own right, I, I deny to see the material world in such a way. I deny that. And let me add this. I would have all reason to regard bodily matters as negative. I'm chronically ill and I suffer from quite a lot of limitations and strong anxieties induced by a fail and falling apart body. But that is how nature is. And let me turn this around to another point. There is something here, it is something that I, I, I looked ahead. It was something about the so-called, I don't know if, uh, if this is truly what Pythagoras taught, because we don't know for sure. I believe it is more a Neoplatonist way of Demophilius and then saying, oh, this was the teaching of Pythagoras, but I don't know, maybe it was, I don't care. Here there is this, where was it? Divinity sends evil to man, not as being influenced by anger, but both for the sake of purification. No, no, no. This is the Christian idea that the God sent us, or the biblical idea, God sent us to, to Hiob, 
like Hiob, who is tested by God, by everything is taken away from him. And then the teaching is, be patient and accept your suffering, overcome it by letting go. This is this, the Stoicism, which is another thing which I'm always at war with. No. No. Stoicism, like getting rid of accepting injustice done to you by random chance or by other people. Usually what happens to you is, or very often, what happens to you is done by other people. So there are people who do something which is evil, which they have the choice not to do to you. And I'm sorry, I'm bringing the largest possible weapon that I have because it makes it crystal clear how wrong both Stoicism and Neoplatonism are. The bloody motherfucking Holocaust. I am both German and to a small line Jewish, so I am on both sides of the Holocaust history, from the family speaking. There is no justification to say that is sent by the gods to test people. I'm sorry. I, I reject this. I reject this. I reject this. If something evil happens to people, and the Holocaust is probably rock bottom evil, maybe the people of the antiquity were not able to imagine such horror. I don't know. Maybe were they not sensitive enough because their life was so full of death penalties. I mean, it was an age where there was constant war. It was an age where where, where penalties were extremely harsh, where many people were quite brutal. I mean, just look at the entire Roman circus arena games. So probably the, their society was so brutalized, so used to brutality that they didn't see it. I don't know what the explanation is. and Frankly, it's not much of an issue what the explanation is, but it is wrong. Gods do not send things to plague us and to test us. Not in that way. I reject this. Because if we open the door to it in one case, we must take it in every case. And I reject this. If we come to the point that the Holocaust would be something to test people, I'm sorry, then the entire idea of religion would be destroyed. And then we have the problem of how, which I'm writing for decades, for decades, that the problem of monotheism is then the same we have as a Neoplatonic polytheism or paganism. If there is a one source of everything, be it God or the Platonic one, I don't care. That is just more the definition. One is a person, the other is a, a power. It doesn't matter. If we have a one from which all things come, and if that one, then this one necessarily must be good, of course, otherwise spirituality wouldn't make sense. And then where does evil come from? You have that problem. If a perfect one creates a creation, and what is in creation is clearly not perfect, then logically the one could not have been perfectly good or not perfect, either one or both. It is more easy to understand in the terms of monotheism. If the monotheist God is all-knowing, all-good, all-kind and all-powerful, which essentially is an absurd view about a God, but Let's just say it. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, all-kind. And how does it come that he creates a creation which fails? Which can, it comes, to, comes to the point that suffering is created. No. There must be a limit to the power of anything. That is why the gods in the pagan view are not all powerful. It's not to diminish the god, but it's a reality. And, they are, and that is, 
Even here, I, I think expressis verbis, it is written that the gods are all powerful and it is not possible because otherwise we would be puppets. We would be not free. And if we were not free, none of our decisions could be morally evil. If I'm a sock puppet, I am not responsible for anything I say, but the one that is the puppeteer. In the same way, if the perfect God of the Jews or the Christians or the Muslims, if the perfect one God who is all good, all kind, all knowing and all powerful creates a being like humans and these beings apparently fail in a sense given by the measures of this God, they sin by disobedience, then apparently the one who created those beings is to blame because he created them flawed. It is an irrational and illogical concept. From a perfect good can come nothing evil. It is, it is an impossibility. There must be a wiggling room where there is no influence. And that is why the gods do not rule our thoughts. They don't even entirely rule our fate. It is one of the most important things of every, or let's say of the Indo-European pagan religions, to separate fate and the gods. In the Nordic Germanic religion, for instance, we have the gods and we have the three norns. In the Greek, Greek or Roman way, we have the parce or the three fates who weave the strings of fate of a mortal man. And the fates or the norns are not under the command of the gods. They're not. There is a fate that is woven to mortals. Now, I am not so keen on the entire fate thing anyway. Anyway, I do not believe in fate in such a way. I believe in tendencies. It is where I admittedly am more on the side of Aristotle. I try to argue about what I can see. I mean, I am an occultist and a magician, so seeing, of course, includes the magic world, the magic experience, the shamanistic experience, that is including what I experience. And then I can conclude from what I experience. So it is like Aristotelian method of creating our idea of the cosmos. From experience, I conclude how things be. And having a one is illogical. It is simply an illogical way to look at the world. There is no one. There is zero and the next step from zero is two. It, it, jumps, it jumps over the point of one and the one is numerologically, cosmological, a non-existing idea. There is no one. There is a zero where there is nothing, and then it is split up into positive, negative, hot, cold, yin, yang. And so from zero, the two comes to be. There is, there is at no point of this creational act, is there a one? It's, it's, it doesn't exist. It is an illogical, it is an illogicality. I don't know if it is a word in English. And now you have, you have a duality. For instance, you have, what is it, Gaia and Uranus, if I'm having it right from the Greek. Sky, Father, Mother, Earth. Yin, Yang. Now you can say that, of course, in a way, we desire to rise up to spirituality, to leave the tightness of the material world behind and ascend. True. Given. I admit that is the aim of spirituality. But I deeply reject this idea that the higher world is something that is contrary to matter. 
like this idea that if we reincarnate or if we ascend to higher planes of reality by bettering ourselves, by rising up spiritually, that we live in a world that is like we are ghosts, like we are immaterial ghosts. I believe there are higher worlds for higher developed souls, but they are not unmaterial. The material world of these, it's my imagination about things. It's just, I'm making this up. Okay, that's my point here. I believe these higher worlds are also material, but the, ma the matter is not restricting. It is a matter that is, if you wish in a way, it is like a super magical world, so to speak. Where matter is not bending your will, but matter is flowing with you according to your will. So it is essentially, I believe that's where the gods live, where the diamonds live, where the higher spirits live. They do not enter a reality which is spirit, which is bodiless, like a ghost. I, I find that absurd and I find that unpagan and unpolicized. But they live in a reality where matter is no longer restricting them, where all the things which they materially are or dwell in, if you wish, maybe that matter is more like we have clothing, I don't know, because it is not knowable. It is not in the finality knowable to us. But what I believe, what I assume is that it is a different kind of world with different kind of physical laws which are under will. Where, where these fully developed perfect beings like gods and like fully enlightened beings, otherwise humans who rise up to full enlightenment, they do not live as ghosts, as as immaterial bodies, but they dwell in in realities where matter is no longer a hindrance, but always forms according to your will. That is what I believe. For otherwise, you would detract yourself from yin and yang. You would you would you would come to an a place which is not possible to exist. Because, as I said, the one is not a possible, it's not a possible place. So what must happen is the entire, that the, that the dual system in, in its entirety must develop. So there must be a world, a sphere of reality, which is not undualistic, which is not where you're free of material things, but where both are transcended, transformed in an alchemistic way, so to speak, where the material world is no longer a hindrance to your will, your essence of, of, of walking ahead, of going, of not so much of being, because being suggests a state which is stagnant. And I see, see gods and the divine as an agent, a movement, something that, that directs and what was very wise of the Asians that they connected the gods with planets. Because the planets have something that they revolve. They circle. They move. That is not to say that the essence of the god changes. The gods are indeed unchanging. But it is not an unchanging in the sense that they are like a statue which is not movable. It is something different. That is why I am so adamant to say that there is not a one, not a core, but the origin itself is already from the get-go multifaced. You have first the prime duality, which is Gaia and Uranus, or heaven and earth, or yin and yang, but that is the primordial order. The order of our world is stepping away from the duality and into the trinity. And you know this from all the pagan polytheist myths alike. There is the primordial world. For instance, in the Azatru, there is um, the world of fire, Muspelheimer, and the world of ice. Um, I think Niflheimer is the name. Or in the 
the Greek myth, you have, as I said, Gaia and Uranus. That is the primordial di uh, uh, duality of a world in the Titanic era. Enter the gods. And then you have always a triad. The world is reshaped from a dualistic to a triadic reality. And this is essential. It is very essential to understand this, that our world that we live in is is no longer the dualic, but actually the triadic reality. We have we have Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Zeus governs the spiritual realm of air. Poseidon, the changeable reality of the waters. Hades, the dark density on the core of the earth. None of this is good and evil. These are three principles, and the triadic thinking is, I admit, it is something extremely difficult. Because the tendency of our mind goes to translate the triad into duality, like saying, okay, there is darkness, light, and balance. No, that is not triadic thinking. That is still dualistic thinking. A triadic thinking means that the third element must, have, must be something in its own right, equal to the other three. So it cannot be balance. Because if we would translate the triad into, oh, heaven, good, underworld, evil, and then there is the third. No, Poseidon is not balance that is between the two. And it is, enti it is entirely wrong. It is why, for instance, when, I don't know if the author, the translator Thomas Taylor wrote it, or if Zalust wrote it, that, that there are souls who are fallen and they go into the darkness of Tartarus, like an eternal punishment of hell. No, that is not pagan thought. That is the degeneracy of paganism. I'm sorry, I have to say it. Like Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche wrote his text, The Antichrist, which is something that deeply influenced me, which made me stop being a Christian when I was a teenager. And it is exactly that dualism of spirit, good, earth, evil, which I absolutely reject because in a Nietzschean sense good is willpower good is the will to power the will of life of living of creating of struggling for something moving ahead to divine is to be is the core of of the movement the agents of movement Life that endlessly goes on. The sun is a process, an unending process that generates flame and light. And when it holds, it is death. So let me think if I have forgotten some points that I wanted to, to say. I think I stop it now. I see it's already oh. Goodness, 40 minutes. I had thought it would be 10 minutes by now. Let's see how fast the time passes when I'm babbling. I'm sorry about this. So I thought oh, I have made some points about this, why I reject this. And the triadic thinking would be something else to, to, to go into. But it is a thought which is extremely difficult to explain and it would be a topic for another time. I hope if, if you are neoplatonist and want to remain so, it's all, all glory to you. I'm not against it. I just say why I vehemently reject it and why I reacted negatively and very strongly to it. And I hope it did make at least sense, even if you do not agree, it made sense why it is so. I believe paganism, polytheism has to have a different sort of spirituality that is not based on the evil of Hüle, of the evil nature of the evil earth, and seeing the divine as some sort of ghost, like a haunting spirit in a haunting manner, like an uncorporeal haunting ghost. No, the divine is part of the world. It is not an, an, an outsider like, like Jehovah, the, the Christian God or the Jewish God. The divine makes metal, makes material, the matter sacrum. But sacrum is not holy. Sacrum is part of the world. Okay, I finished the, my oh, way too long speech about things. I hope you get an impression why I disagree. 
uh, and um, let me know what you think about things.